Without a doubt, one of the most controversial and polarizing figures in arm wrestling, Monster Michael Todd makes the pendulum between beloved and hated swing wildly. In actuality, who is Michael Todd? And through which highs and lows did he become the notorious figure in arm wrestling he is today? I am the Arm Historian, and in this video we'll explore the rise and fall of Monster Michael Todd. Michael Todd was born on the 12th of June 1973 in Melbourne, a small city in the county seat of Hot Spring County, Arkansas, USA. While originally used as a railroad stop, Melbourne later became known as the brick capital of the world, when the production of bricks from locally available clay became prominent. Little is known publicly about Michael's early childhood, but according to his own account, he had memories of locals in the mainly working-class city of Malvern, settling debts and testing their strength through arm wrestling. This mindset was confirmed to Michael even further when his father would challenge him to arm wrestling matches to check his developing physical power. It wasn't until years later, after his 15th birthday, he managed to consistently beat his father in arm wrestling. Before dedicating his life fully to arm wrestling though, Michael was enamored with martial arts. First honing his skills in karate, he was later allegedly awarded his black belt in taekwondo. It wasn't until somewhere in 1990, a year before he would graduate high school, Michael came across an advert for a local wrist wrestling tournament at the Saline County Fair. Although the term is sometimes used interchangeably with traditional arm wrestling, wrist wrestling could also refer to a once fairly popular form of arm wrestling that has since fallen into obscurity, where competitors grab each other's non-active hand instead of the now used pegs. Todd would compete in the tournament and receive third place, igniting his passion and eventual obsession with the sport of arm wrestling. In the following couple of years, he would start organizing his own small tournaments at a local boys club and start focusing on building up his own strength and technique. In 1992, Mike tried his hand at his first major tournament, the US Nationals. After this, he started participating in several professional tournaments throughout the US, while working independently as a body transformation coach. It wasn't until the start of the new millennium that Michael would see his first national title, being known as a quick and tenacious shoulder presser, Michael further developed his technique, training his strength and eventually winning several national and regional titles throughout the next decade. By the time 2007 rolls around, Mike is making a name for himself in Neil Pickup's Armoire series, and for the first time showing more of his personality and mindset to the arm wrestling world. Michael appears superficially confident and relatively combative on the table. Because of this and his big stature, Michael is baptized Monster by the high priest of arm wrestling nicknames, Neil Pickup. Around 2011, while still working as a personal trainer and body transformation coach, Mike meets a woman named Rebecca. While originally a student of his, the two hit it off and develop what is by all accounts a whirlwind romance, eventually tying the knot three years on in 2014. Rebecca would end up playing a big role in Michael's public persona, as well as his arm wrestling career. Several years on, we start to see Michael utilizing more of an open style of arm wrestling, often dropping into an open arm top roll or a full on king's move. Partly because of the relatively lenient arm wars rules, Monster Michael Todd found a lot of success with this style, allowing him to drop low under the table, his humorous bones sometimes in a declined angle, all the while trying to keep his hand and pronation somewhat engaged. Michael would later say he mainly deployed this tactic because of damage to his hand, wrist and multiple fractures in his arm. Indeed, one can notice how by this time, his elbow joint is developing a lock at an angle, essentially making it impossible to straighten out completely. Although drawing out a fair amount of criticism and controversy in the then relatively popular arm wrestling forums, it isn't until the rise of social media and arm wrestling on YouTube when the floodgates are truly opened, with him receiving comments condemning his king's move as not real arm wrestling and all around cheating. Around this time, the monster would earn a second nickname, although now less pleasing to Michael and his ever-growing, seemingly somewhat fragile ego. Michael Under the Table Todd was born, 
a moniker that he continues to struggle with and that follows him until this day. Around the middle of the last decade, a new beast reared its head in the arm wrestling tournament scene. The World Arm Wrestling League, or WAL, was born, and with it came a whole new wave of potential fans and scrutiny. Much like its older brother, Arm Wars, WAL came in with loose rules, running fouls, and added bigger elbow pads. These factors arguably played to Michael's advantage, allowing him to dip deeper below the table in his king's move and extending how far back he could drag his elbow. On the bright side, this opened the door for Michael to do really well at this league, after which he earned several champion titles over the next few years and a few very notable wins. On the flip side though, the spotlight that was now pointed directly on Michael invited more critics and eyes on his arm wrestling, as well as his often brazen personality on the table. When interviewed after the matches, Michael appeared mostly emotional and focused some of his attention on the love he shares with his wife, Rebecca. This sudden switch from combative and righteous down to downtrodden and slightly emotional would become a hallmark of the arm wrestler's career. One of the best known and controversial examples of this was in the seemingly never-ending match between him and Jerry Cataret in the Wall 506 title match. Throughout this grueling match, Mike starts talking to his wife, telling her he injured his arm and generally upping the dramatics to a maximum. When the last round ends with the strap coming loose, the ref calls for a restart. Michael, seemingly fueled by adrenaline and what is in his eyes an unjust call, starts demanding he be granted the win. Whether or not he should have been granted the win is certainly up for debate, but I think the more interesting thing in this interaction is Michael's slightly unhinged behavior and the stark contrast between him and Jerry Cataret in this moment. Unlike Jerry, who puts in his two cents and eventually relents to Michael in the ref's call, Mike, seemingly reinforced by Rebecca, is completely unwilling to give in and restart the match. Ultimately, the monster is granted the hammer and title and the match is declared over. Not long before this match, around 2018, Michael started to post more on social media, uploading sporadic exercise and match videos on YouTube. While having some success here with quite a bit of fans gaining an insight into his personal life and being exposed to more of Michael's personality, it also meant he was exposed to a larger number of comments by people who were, to say the least, very critical of his arm wrestling style. This certainly did not improve throughout the next couple of years. The world became engulfed in one of the biggest pandemics of the modern age, and arm wrestling wasn't spared, with several leagues cancelling their events. Although one would at first expect this to be a huge detriment to the growth and evolution of the sport, exactly the opposite happened. Arm wrestling saw a boom in popularity like never before. While this subject deserves a video of its own, it's safe to say the introduction of new voices on various social media channels and people having more free time to discover old and recent arm wrestling matches played a big role. Once again, considering all ships rise with the tide, this brought an as of yet unseen amount of attention and scrutiny to Michael Todd. Instead of ignoring many of the negative comments, Michael, as well as Rebecca to an extent, started rebutting and frequently addressing the negative attention. Perhaps partly to grow his channel and online notoriety, but certainly also because of an unrelenting will to prove himself in the right and painting his retractors as simple haters who stand in the way on his road to becoming the best ever. With Levan clearly emerging as the undisputed number one during this time, Michael's ultimate goal became clear. With many recognizing Michael as a number two, or at least a serious contender, it seemed this clash of titans was inevitable. When a match with the Georgian Hulk was not readily available within a short amount of time, Michael decided to organize a little refresher match, Devon Larratt. With Larratt recovering from serious health issues, Michael saw this as an opportunity to score a quick win in a conventional style, perhaps in a bid to win back some goodwill from the arm wrestling public. In the lead up to the match, Mike looked to be in tip top shape and touted to be the strongest he has ever been. For those reasons, a lot of fans picked Mike as the clear favorite. Come the week of the match, however, it soon became apparent that Devon likewise showed up in never-before-seen form, seemingly packing a large amount of mass and fully recovered. While Mike showed some vitriol and fighting spirit in the very early stages of the match, Devon dominated and overpowered Michael easily during the rest of the match. 
At a certain point, Mike seems to have accepted his inevitable defeat and even asks Devon to please not hurt him. After the match, Mike appears gracious in defeat, reiterates that he is in the best shape he has ever been and proclaims that Devon was clearly the better man that day. Not long after though, when talking about a match, Michael insinuates that not everything was as it seemed, later going into detail over how he wasn't feeling like himself when he returned home and was considerably weaker than he originally espoused. This pattern of Michael claiming to be a bigger, better version of himself in the follow-up to a match, to then losing the match and later laying claim to any possible excuse, quickly became a mainstay, sometimes going as far as not even recognizing the match result and proclaiming himself as a true winner after the facts. A prime example of this came after one of his recent losses against the Georgian giant Revas Lutidze. The match was a real grinder and in my opinion a treat to watch. Even though Mike lost, it would have been a great opportunity for him to be humble, recognize Revaz as a great arm wrestler and look at why he lost as a learning experience. Instead, Michael decides to blame the referees and uptalk his own strength and arm wrestling prowess at every opportunity after the match. After this, he vows to come back as whichever version of the monster we are currently at and the cycle continues. During the last couple of years, Michael decided to start a venture in the tournament organizing scene by organizing the Monster Factory, a series of super matches with prominent and less popular names out of the US arm wrestling scene. While I see this as a mostly positive evolution and appreciate the effort that goes into creating something like this, Michael and Rebecca being at the helm here didn't exactly leave it free of controversy. Because of Michael and in the latest edition even Rebecca pulling in the tournament, as well as some of their close friends and themselves also commentating the event, it seems a lot of people took issue with impartialness. The announcers and organizers would often be actively rooting for certain competitors over others, and sometimes even find their way on stage, seemingly intervening at key points in the match. While this is certainly not unique to Michael as an organizer, the small scale of the venue and to a certain degree the tournament made it all the more blatant. Another point of contention were some of the sponsors the Monster Factory chose to work with. A certain company that was heavily shown off at the latest edition of the tournament holds very dubious claims about their efficacy and overall product. If one were to look into what this company really sold and how little scientific groundwork has been done to validate these products and services, this choice of sponsor could be worth questioning at the very least. In the end, I see Monster Michael Todd as an endlessly fascinating but ultimately tragic character within the armorsing world. He seems to possess the uncanny ability to be at the same time very affected by all the criticism but also totally unwilling to accept any validity or opportunities for self-reflection from it, often putting up a shield of faux humility, quickly followed by singing his own praises. And while I certainly appreciate the unrelenting nature Michael brings to the table and all he has done to help grow the sport, I can't help but look forward to the next oxymoronic monster thought statement we can collectively discuss. Perhaps best summarizing this video and Michael as an arm wrestler in my view is a very telling quote in his own words. I did not have any trophies because I did not play any team sports. So if I went to my friend's house and he had a big trophy shelf, I did not have that. I kept every trophy I have won for the last 32 years. I love this sport. Thank you for watching the rise and fall of Monster Michael Todd. If you have any suggestions for my next video or feedback on this video, let me know in the comments below. Also, consider putting the like button in a deep hook and smashing it to the pad. Arm Historian, out.